Well, I'm glad you could join us here today. Welcome here. My name is Jason, and I'm one of the pastors here at The Open Door. And, you know, in this last week, if you are all into astronomy or even just read the news, you'll have probably heard a lot about what? Somebody say it. Supermoon. That sounds so amazing. Supermoon. Like, what's so special about a supermoon? Jack, can I have you up here for a second? I'm going to show you what's so special. I was going to call it, at least leave Dave up here, because I think me and Dave are about the same size. But I decided to use Jack. So Jack, can you stand right here? Imagine Jack's the regular full moon. I'm the super moon. <laughs> Come on. I mean, look at that. Wow. Look, look at that. I, I'm that much more super. All right, you can sit down, Jack. Thanks. Can you flip to the next slide? This is the actual difference between the regular moon and the super moon. It is that much closer. It's pretty impressive, isn't it? It would be up to 15% bigger than a regular full moon as defined by, well, here, now here we're going to test some terms. I was talking to Melissa Wall yesterday, and I said, okay, Melissa, today in church, you're going to lose a, learn a couple of new terms. So here's the deal. The moon isn't actually on a, on a circular orbit. The moon's on an elliptical orbit. So what that means is it's, it's shaped like an oval or an ellipsoid. So it doesn't just perfectly rotate around the earth. It has a bit of a swing to it. It goes a little further away, and then comes a bit closer, and it goes a little bit further away, and comes a bit up. The moon does. Now, the, the furthest point in that orbit away is called the apogee. And the closest point to the earth is called the perigee. So when you're at the apogee, if you have a full moon, you have a boring moon. That's a boring time to have a full moon. We all know this. It's the perigee where you want the full moon. And so what happens is when the moon happens to be full on its perigee, on its point where it's closest to Earth, we get a, not super moon yet, a big full moon. But the average eye can hardly even notice the difference between the apogee full moon and the perigee full moon. But what happens is the full moon is full because the earth and the sun are basically in alignment, somewhat in alignment, right? I mean, if you imagine this is the earth and the keyboard as the moon, then the sun's got to be somewhere in this range out here for that to look full. Because if the sun's way out on the other side, then the back side of the moon is bright and we'll get a new moon because it'll be dark on this side, right? The super moon happens when the sun and the earth are almost perfectly in alignment and the gravity of the sun and the gravity of the earth pull the moon just a little bit closer. And then it's full right at that perigee. Super moon. I hope somebody's making money off of this stuff because this is so, so tiny. But I heard about this so much. Like all week, all my news apps, I open them up. First thing, November super moon. I bet you didn't know that the November full moon is called the beaver moon. So we had a beaver supermoon. But here's the thing. The, the moon is on an approximately monthly orbit. And it, it goes from full to crescent to half to new in about an almost monthly orbit. So it's like, um, have you ever been at a stoplight and watching your blinker going click, 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 and the vehicle blinker in front of you is slightly off time, and slowly you can see them lining up? Am I the only guy who gets excited about this? And I'm like, it's going to line up. It's going to line up. And I'm like, no, stay red, stay red. They're going to line up. And then all of a sudden, click, oh, they lined up. It's amazing. And then slowly it pulls out a sequence again. I need help? I saw like four or five of you were really pumped about this. We'll meet afterwards. We'll form our own small group. It'll be depressing. Well, the full moon, the whole full moon cycle and its orbital cycle are kind of like that. It slowly begins to line up. So actually, last month's full moon was within about a percentage point just as big. And next month's full moon in December will be within about a percentage point just as big. So we're in the middle of a supermoon trio. Nobody seems that excited about this, don't worry. But over about a 10-year cycle, it slowly goes in line, and then over another 10-year cycle, it slowly falls out of line. So in about 10 years from now, if you look up and go, man, the moon used to look bigger when I was younger. You're actually right. It, it was bigger. And that's not all. See, but every year, because of losing energy from gravitational rotation, the moon is actually getting a little further away, 3.5 centimeters per year. So in, in my lifetime, depending on how long I live, the moon could be up to six feet further away. So the super moon your children and your children's and children enjoy will be slightly smaller. 
terrible. But the distances are so grand that 3.5 centimeters and 6 feet and the, even the perigee and apogee, which is like substantial number of miles, is barely noticeable. And those distances are nothing, nothing compared to what Michael Collins, not Phil Collins, Michael Collins, has experienced. And actually, a show of hands, does anybody know who Michael Collins is? There's two, three, yeah, he's an astronaut. And if you know his name, if you don't know his name, which I would bet many of you don't, you know his famous friends. He was number three of the three astronauts, including Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins. He always gets that little footnote. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the moon, and Michael Collins was also there. The permanent footnote. You see, what happened was, when, when going to the moon, then NASA sent over a rocket, because that's pretty normal. But then, in, in, a, in a stunning example of logical naming, Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong descended from that rocket in the lunar lander. While Michael Collins stayed up in the also stunningly logically named lunar orbiter. So the lunar lander and the lunar orbiter. And so Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong went down to the surface of the moon. And they walked around on the surface of the moon. It was really cool. And Michael Collins stayed up in the orbiter, tried to make sure everything stayed on a steady arc and on a reliable um, uh, orbit and to maintain radio contact, proper radio contact, with the lunar lander. So Michael Collins was up orbiting around on the moon all by himself. But that's not even the best part. Well, or worst part, depending on how claustrophobic you are and how lonely you get. Because for half of his orbit around the moon, Michael Collins set a world record. He was the only human being ever to be 100% completely isolated since Adam. See, there's a bright side and a dark side of the moon. And contrary to proper popular belief, the dark side of the moon isn't actually dark. It gets about the equal amount of sunlight, right? When the sun's on one side shining on the moon, it's bright on our side. What's on the other side, when our moon looks new, it's bright on the other side of the moon. That's called the dark side of the moon. It's not actually called the dark side of the moon because it doesn't get sun. It's called the dark side of the moon because there's no radio contact with the far side of the moon. And the moon is tidally locked with Earth. That means the moon doesn't spin. It orbits around the Earth, but you always see the man on the moon. You see the same side of the moon. The back side has never been seen in person except by a very small handful of people. And Michael Collins was the only person to have ever viewed the dark side of the moon completely alone. By himself in this little tin can orbiter flying, orbiting a moon that's orbiting Earth tens of thousands of miles away from Earth for over half an hour, he'd be on the dark side of the moon, completely alone, unable to see every single other human being. With the most powerful telescope, he couldn't have seen a single sign of life. NASA Mission Control says it this way. Not since Adam has any human known such solitude as Michael Collins is experiencing during this 47 minutes of each lunar revolution when he's behind the moon with no one to talk to except his tape recorder aboard Columbia. 100% by himself. In his, in his famous book, Michael Collins talks about how he actually wasn't troubled by this. He, he says it this way. He says, I don't mean to deny a feeling of solitude. It is there. Reinf it is there, in fact, reinforced by the fact that radio contact with the Earth abruptly cuts off at the instant I disappear behind the moon. I am alone now. Truly alone and absolutely isolated from any known life. I am it. If a count were taken, the score would be 3 billion plus 2 over on the other side of the moon, and 1 plus God knows what on this side. By himself. In fact, later he goes on to say, far from feeling lonely or abandoned, I feel very much a part of what is taking place on the lunar surface. I know that I'd be a liar or a fool if I said, I have the best of the three Apollo 11 seats. But I can say with truth and equanimity that I am perfectly satisfied with the one I have. This venture had been structured for three men, and I consider my third to be as necessary as either of the other two. Even during those long periods of darkness and solitude, Michael Collins still felt attached. He, in fact, he goes on to say later in, in his book, 
that part of what made him feel so, so connected was the knowledge that in 47 minutes he would reappear and he would learn about all that they had discovered and done in those 47 minutes because he knew what I think most of us know is that an orbit is approximately circular. When you're on the dark side of the moon, wait 47 minutes and you'll be on the light side. When you're on the light side of the moon, wait 47 minutes and you'll be on the dark side. He would go in a circle in an orbit, so he still felt connected even when he was distant. And I don't know if it's true for you, but it's true for me, that sometimes I feel like my life and my walk with God is exactly like that. That there are times when I feel completely close and connected with God, where I hear his voice and I know his will, situation by situation, where I just feel like my relationship with God is so like in sync that I know what he wants, when he wants it, how he wants it, and I have this complete comfort and and an authority that I'm walking in his plan for my life and that his plan for my life is good. And if I, if I were to step outside of his plan by accident, he would guide me and correct me back on his plan. And I, and I, and I know it. I read his word. I read his Bible. And it comes alive to me. And it's so easy and obvious. I don't know if you've ever had a season like that, but it is a great season to be in. But I also know that doesn't stick around. Now, for some of you, I'm, I'm, I'm betting, some of you, you don't know if you actually can hear from God. I mean, you've read the Bible, and you can read the Bible, and you can, you can see what it says in the Bible. But maybe you've never gone through a season where you've really clearly heard from God. You've wondered, is it possible that God, like, he's so big. There's, I mean, and Michael Collins, he says three billion. Well, there's almost seven billion people on earth. Can, can God really hear me? And can he take time to speak to me with all that busy noise going on? I love the way Paul says it in Romans. He says it so clearly. Romans 10, verse 17. He says, so faith comes from what is heard. And what is heard comes through the message about Christ. We can actually hear about Jesus and what his plan is and his will for our life is. And in Jeremiah, this is, this is Old Testament, 33, verse 3. Jeremiah says, call to me. This is speaking, this is God's word to Jeremiah. He says, call to me and I will answer you. Call to me. Speak to me, I'll speak back to you and tell you great and incomprehensible things you do not know. I love when that's how I feel like my relationship is. I call to him and he tells me things. And I feel so connected to God. I've had seasons like that in my life and, and I just, I love those times where like, God, I got a question. He's like, well, I got an answer for you. I'm like, yes, this is fantastic. And then, and then, like Michael Collins sometimes, you go around the dark side of the moon and bam! It, it like cuts off. It's like a tap shuts off sometimes. And that gets hard. I don't, I don't maybe it's me, only me that's had that sort of a season where you just don't feel like you can hear God anymore. And you don't feel that close to him. And I'm not saying I don't know what his plans are for his life. I can still read the Bible, and I can still go to small group, and I can still go to church, and I can hear all about God. And I can, I can know like in my head, in a head sort of thing, what God wants from me. But it doesn't feel real. And I don't hear that like intimate relationship connection thing. That's a hard place to be. That can be a very hard pill to swallow. You ever feel like God's distant from you? And maybe you go to church. Maybe you go to a small group. That can actually make it worse, I find. Because you come to church and you hear about how amazingly close God is to the preacher. I was praying on Thursday and God said, Jason, this is... And it can just feel like you're the only one who doesn't hear God. Or you go to a small group and everybody's sharing about this book they've been reading that's been really speaking to them, whatever that means. And you're going, well, I read a book. It didn't say anything. It was filled with words, and I read them. And somebody else is like, oh, but I read this devotional, and I just knew that was for me this week. And you're going, well, I didn't know anything was for me this week, except for work. Have you ever felt like that? And you don't even want to share it. You don't even want to say it out loud. Because maybe, maybe you don't know that God wants to speak to you. Or maybe you feel like if God's not speaking to you, it's going to be because you've done something wrong. Maybe it's because you feel like God's abandoned you. Or maybe you're going, ah, well, he spoke to me and I didn't quite do it right, so he probably doesn't want to speak to me again. I don't know, you feel really lonely, maybe really isolated. For the first time in my life, I think I've gotten comfort from Job. You ever read the book of Job? Man, that can get depressing. Job, man, 
He went his entire life, and he never once, as far as we're aware, heard God speak. Read through the book of Job. God never speaks to Job. Not once. Through all that hardship, and for all of Job's faith, God never, that we are aware of, speaks directly to Job. But listen to what Job has to say. Chapter 33, verse 14, he says, For God speaks time and again, but a person may not notice it. What he's, what he's talking about is, even when you don't hear it, even when you don't notice it, even when you don't feel it, God's still reaching out to us all the time. Now, in fact, if you don't hear God speak, you're in pretty solid company. Because Job's not the only book of the Bible where somebody has to go through something hard and do something great without hearing from God. The book of Esther and the book of Nehemiah. I saw Esther just look her face up as soon as I said that word. Yeah, now you're paying attention. Book of Esther and the book of Nehemiah. Amazing thing happens. Amazing challenges. And, and, and Nehemiah is a short book. Actually, Esther is a pretty short book. I encourage you, you can read it this week. Like, you can easily read the book of Nehemiah and the book of Esther this week. But look through it carefully. God never once speaks to either of them. That's Job, that's Nehemiah, that's Esther. God didn't speak. And even Mordecai, doing all that amazing stuff in the book of Esther, God never once speaks to them that we are aware of. Maybe before the book was written, maybe after, I don't know. But during the time where this amazing work was being accomplished, complete dark side of the moon radio silence. They had to trust that although they were on some sort of an orbit, that there was a time where God wasn't speaking, but that God was still there, God was still reaching out to him, and he was still real. I don't, I don't know if you've, you're at that place right now in your life where you feel like God's not speaking to you. But if, he, if he's not, if you're not hearing it right now, you're in good company along with Esther, Mordecai, Nehemiah, and Job. But these people had serious challenges. This was a serious test. God didn't just say like, like hey, can you share the gospel with somebody and I'm not going to speak to you for a while. and see." What... These people had major challenges. Nehemiah first has to go talk to the, Isra uh, the Israelites who, whose city has been demolished and they're living in squalor. And he shows up there and they don't even believe in themselves or that God could care. And Nehemiah's got to convince them that God cares and loves them and wants to rebuild their city. And then some of them kind of grudgingly believe in him and start working. But then everybody around them, all of the other uh, kings and chiefs in the area, they want to shut him down and, and attack him because they're afraid that they'll get too powerful. And so Nehemiah has to rally these like barely confident Israelites to help him fight against these people to help build the wall. And then, and then there's poverty problems and then there's disagreements amongst who's doing who, how much work. And, and all of this for years, Nehemiah's working and he doesn't hear from God. Esther and Mordecai both risk death. They never once hear from God. Silence. Mordecai, Esther, Job, Nehemiah, they all did their best work, their most amazing and greatest accomplishments on the dark side of the moon, not hearing from God. They didn't see that as an excuse. See, one of the things that's really amazing is that God has brought you into a community of believers. That, that's actually a really amazing thing. I, I think sometimes maybe we don't see the benefit of that. But God's a relational God, and he wants to have a relationship with you. But God's also a communal God, and he wants to work through a body of believers. That's why there's so much in the Bible about getting together, about meeting together, about strengthening each other, about caring for one another. Because sometimes when we're going through radio silence, God is actually giving somebody else something to encourage us. And he's actually bringing us together. You see, if God gave us everything we need by ourselves as individual units, we wouldn't need each other. And he knows we're better together than we are separate. That's why at the Open Door, we, we like to have small groups because we believe we actually are better together in groups where we can care for each other because sometimes when we're going through radio silence, somebody else is really hearing what God's saying. And we can be encouraged by that and we can learn from that. God also gave us his word. His Bible is constant. His Bible is his solid word for all generations at all times that we can read and understand. I mean, Esther and Mordecai and Job, they all had access to God's word even when God wasn't directly speaking to them. And I know there's something amazing that happens when it comes alive in a way as God is just speaking directly to us. But there's also something that amazing that happens as we deepen our faith and trust God in that silence. I was so impressed reading what Michael Collins had to say about how unconcerned he was about himself. He knew 
NASA had done everything to test everything, that even when he was by himself, everything would work just like it was supposed to. He would keep doing his job knowing, in 47 minutes later, I'll come out on the other side, and everything, all that NASA control had been doing, would still be operating. So he knew he had to do his part, even when he couldn't hear, nobody was supervising him, they couldn't talk to him. He knew he had to do his part, so that when they came together on the other side of the moon, the bright side of the moon, they could complete their mission. I just really felt like, when I was preparing for this message, this might not be for everybody here, but there are some people here who need to hear this. I felt like God was saying this to some of you. And I want you to hear this. If you hear nothing else today, I want you to hear this. You may not be hearing from God directly. You may not feel close to him. But have faith, stay strong, and follow him. Draw near to him, and he will draw near to you. Seek him, and you will find him. I'm not saying it's not tough. But we want to be a church who not only believes that God speaks to us directly, but also stands by you when it's hard. Both. I don't think you have to choose. I think you can know there are seasons where God speaks to you directly, and we want to encourage you to be able to live into those times. We also want to encourage you when you're not in those times. And some of you are hurting right now, and you're feeling alone and isolated, and I want you to know God loves you and God cares for you. And these seasons also pass. So stay strong and have faith. I love how David, King David of the Bible, when he's feeling hemmed in and he's attacked and he feels like God doesn't see the injustice all around him and he cries out to God in, in Psalms 5 verse 3. He says, at daybreak, Lord, you hear my voice. At daybreak, I plead my case to you and watch expectantly. I think that's where we need to be, watching expectantly, believing God will speak, even if it's silent now, that he loves you and cares for you, and he will seek you out. He hasn't forgotten you. You're not isolated. You're not alone. You're surrounded by other believers who care for you and want to love you like Christ loves you. And even if they don't see the depths of your hurt, that God does, and that God will care for you. Now, for some of you, you've probably never heard God's voice. You've never heard him speak to you. Maybe you never even believed he could. For others, maybe it's been so long since you've heard God speak, you're wondering, like, did he just speak and then forget me? Am I by myself now? Or maybe what he's spoken to you is so hard, you're not sure how you can go about doing it. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you long to have a relationship with us, and I thank you that you speak to us, and I thank you, God, that although you've sp spoken to us so powerfully through your word, that you speak to us also through your spirit, and that the word and the spirit can come together and become meaningful and alive and understandable to us. And God, I know that there are many people who have never heard your voice, and God, right now, I just pray that you would guide those people up to be prayed for, and that as we pray and lay hands as elders on those people, like your word says, that you would speak to them, this very week. And God, for the people who are hurting, and their journey's been long, and God, they haven't heard from you for so long, I just pray that there would be a healing balm that you would bring on them today, God, as they would seek prayer. And Lord, if you've spoken to people, God, and it's hard, and they want more of you, and they want to understand more, and they want to push in more, I just pray, God, that you would give them so much more and reward them for their faithfulness. And for everybody standing up here today, who's willing to pray for these people, whether they're comfortable with it or not, God, I just pray your anointing power. For we, Lord, we know and we step in confidence that you want to speak to us, you want to be real to us, that your silence is only for a time, God. And God, I just pray right now that your spirit would anoint these people standing in bravery to pray for these people, Lord. And, and what happens, the symbolic thing we are doing now in the physical realm, God, I pray you would honor it in your spirit in the spiritual realm, Lord God, and there would be breakthrough for these people. And I pray all of this in your name, amen.